Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to my vegetable garden. I have been shooting videos recently in other parts of our landscape, so it's nice to finally welcome you back and give you an update on how everything is growing so far. Now, you might recall that we have been experiencing an extremely cold and wet spring, one of the coldest on record. So the plants are struggling. You might see a tomato plant that you think, boy, my plants are way bigger than that. Or maybe you might look at our corn and think, gee, that looks kind of stunted. It's because they are struggling with the weather. But today it is absolutely gorgeous. We've got a nice bright blue sky. I got birds singing and so it's a great day for a tour. Now as a quick recap, I live in Spokane, Washington with my husband. It is zone 5B and 6 in this region. Spokane is about 300 miles east of Seattle, almost to the Idaho border. We get very cold winters here and normally really quite pleasant springs, but this one has been a doozy. Now before I get started, I wanted to point out my lovely Garden Like a Girl t-shirt. I got it at the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival in Seattle this February. And I was so impressed with the way this company operates because it is made of upcycled cotton and recycled plastic bottles. It is soft as can be. And they donate a portion of their profits from the sales to cancer research. So this is a great company. If you have a chance, check them out at gardenlikeagirl.com. Now, since it is super sunny, I've got my sun hat on. Remember to do that when you're gardening. And what I'm going to do is take you from raised bed to raised bed so you can see how everything is doing. First up is the leek and onion bed. On the right are the Bulgarian giant leeks that I started from seed way back in January. And they are doing great. Now, they're in one of the beds that is very close to a hedge on the north side. They do get sunshine. There might be a little bit of root competition, but I'm hoping they'll be growing okay. The onions on the left are not doing as well as I would like. That happens. If you've been following me recently, you know that this is one of the beds that is part of an experiment we're conducting with a new product, at least new to us. This is an agricultural insect netting with a tiny mesh. It's quite durable. And the idea is to keep certain types of insects away from the plants inside. It is UV stabilized. It's made from polypropylene. And this is one of the covered raised beds that we made it's a DIY project in my book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, which you can get from me. And what I've got growing in here are lettuces, arugula, and there was pak choy in here. So in this bed, I'm trying to keep aphids and cabbage worms away from the arugula and also from the pak choy while it was still in here. We've harvested and eaten all of that. And also, I'm keeping birds away from the lettuce plants because they love to tear at the leaves. So not an insect problem, but it's kind of doing double duty for us. So I'll show you how everything's growing. The lettuce has been doing great and feeding us well, but you can see that the butter crunch lettuce is starting to bolt to seed. That's something that just happens naturally after a certain point, especially when the temperatures warm up because they're a cool season crop. And the leaves are just a teensy bit bitter, but not too bad. So I'm going to be harvesting these ones for lunch today. I also wanted to point out these micro misters. These are something that Bill set up for me because lettuce really likes to have extra moisture. So there's three of them in this bed. It just gives them a little bit of extra water when the drip irrigation system is running. Next up is a bed of red onions that Bill started from seed. You can see that the plants are doing really well. Now this bed also has some micro misters on which Bill is going to remove. He can just take that part of the drip irrigation line off of the bed and plug the opening. 
but he wanted to get those plants off to a good start. But so far, so good. Hmm, the next bed has some floating row cover on it. I wonder why that might be. Here's why there was a cover on the bed. It's because I'm growing a few different types of crops that are very susceptible to damaging insect pests. I'm also noticing that these silky sweet turnips are really wilting. I don't know why, because we have been getting so much rain lately that the soil is plenty wet, but I might give them a little bit of water just to perk them up. But turnips are members of the cabbage family. They can get aphids, they can get root maggots, they can get cabbage worms. So I wanted to use that floating row cover as a physical barrier to keep those insects away from them. We've almost finished this row of radishes. Plum purple is the variety. I just have two left here. And they are also members of the cabbage family, so they are very susceptible to damaging insects. And then over here are some beets, and they are susceptible to leaf miners, which are awful. So that's why I'm using a cover. I'm just giving them a little bit of water real quickly. So there's two things I wanted to mention when it comes to protecting plants by using a cover. The first thing is that you should always put the cover on as soon as you plant your seeds or seedlings and weigh it down so that it won't blow off because it won't be a physical barrier to keep those insects away if it has blown off of the crops. The other thing is I have to admit even though I love floating row cover, you can't see through it to see things like the wilting leaves as easily as you can with the agricultural insect netting that we're using this year. So that is a point in the favor of the insect netting. Here's a close-up on some of those silky sweet turnips. You know, ordinarily I thin them out but they don't seem to really care if they're planted closely together or not. I realize I'm not being a good example, but they're doing great. And you know, these turnips, you can eat them like an apple. I know that sounds crazy. They are very tender. They do not have what I consider kind of a funky aftertaste of the standard types of turnips. So I really do recommend them. The seeds came from Burpee. Next up is our fava bean bed. That is a type of a broad bean. They are growing really nicely. And you may have noticed this snake here. Don't worry, it's actually just a toy snake or a fake snake. You can get them at the dollar stores. And I was using it initially to make sure that while the plants were small, the quail that are in our yard would not come and peck on the leaves. And so now I think the plants can fend for themselves and I can move that snake to another area that needs protecting. Well, I'm happy to finally unveil our gutter peas. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, look for one of my videos on my YouTube channel earlier this spring. We started them indoors in rain gutters and then I slid the contents of each one out into a trench at planting time. And there's an interesting story behind these. First of all, these are green arrow shelling peas. We love this variety. Second of all, a few weeks ago, they did not look this great. You would think that peas would be very happy for rain. Nope, they looked awful. They actually got snowed on while we were out of town at Easter time. And I thought, oh, these guys are goners. And then here we are. They are doing great. I'm a little nervous because we have some hot weather, believe it or not, coming later this week and into next week. But the nice thing is they're covered with pea pods. Some of them are starting to fill out with peas. And you know, these pods are just as tasty as the fresh peas. And actually, pea foliage tastes like peas, and it's edible. So. If for some reason they don't like this hot weather coming, we can quickly harvest these and eat them that way. This is our other raised bed that has a hinged lid. 
it also has that agricultural insect netting on it. And let me show you what's growing inside so that you'll understand why the netting is on this bed. Looks pretty good in here, doesn't it? So I've got Swiss chard in here. It's a mix called Rainbow Blend, so it has different colored stems on the leaves. This is pak choy or bok choy. Its variety is bopak. And we have been making salads with this and it is amazing. And then what's growing behind those are two rows of beets, golden beets, and then a red type of a beet. I can't remember the variety off the top of my head. And then I also had a few leftover leek plants. So I've got two here and two on the other end, but everything is growing well. So the bok choy is a member of the cabbage family. It is susceptible to aphids and cabbage worms. The Swiss chard is a member of the beet family, beets, spinach, and Swiss chard. They are all susceptible to leaf miners, which ruin the leaves in nothing flat. And of course, that's what you're harvesting and eating. Now I need to thin the beets and you can bet that I'm going to eat the leaves because those are delicious steamed with a little bit of butter and a little bit of red wine vinegar. So that's why we're covering this bed to keep those insects away and it is working great. Next up is a quick tour of our little hoop house. This is something that Bill designed and built quite a few years ago. It fits over two of our raised beds. It is 10 feet wide by nine feet long. And we use it this time of year to grow heat loving crops such as peppers, cucumbers, melons, and so on. And then in the winter, I grow exceptionally cold tolerant crops to feed us throughout the winter, but we don't use any supplemental heat. If you're interested in knowing more about the hoop house, just go to my website, susansinthegarden.com, and do a search on the words hoop house project. Now, Bill is a pepper growing expert, and he absolutely loves starting them from seed and trying different varieties every year. So I'm just gonna pan through the hoop house you can see that the plants are doing really well. And they have certainly benefited from the added heat inside the hoop house. Now the hoop house has two doors in it, one on each end. And what we do as the temperatures warm up, we open one door and then pretty soon just leave both doors open and that way the pollinators can easily find their way in. Well, this is one of my three tomato beds and I don't want any wisecracks about how small my plants are because they have really struggled with the weather we've been experiencing. They are looking very healthy though. I'm happy about that. They're looking more sturdy and I think that they're really going to be shooting up and getting into production with the warm weather we've got coming. You can see that I grow them along a sheet of concrete reinforcing wire that's attached to heavy duty fence posts. And I just kind of weave the plants in and out a bit and also use a bit of twine to keep them close. This has worked really well for me. So what's growing in this bed is mortgage lifter. I'm trying it for the first time this year. I've heard a lot of good things about it. And chef's choice orange. I have to grow this tomato every year because it is the most fantastic slicing tomato and anything that you make with it is fabulous. In this next bed, I've got a couple of artichoke plants, some marigolds, some zinnias, and these bush beans are top crop. I grew them for the first time last year, and they are extremely productive, best bush beans I have ever tasted. Now, Bill loves growing anything that's a member of the allium family. So what you're seeing in the foreground, those taller plants, are shallots. The little plants that are planted in clumps around the shallots are a type of onion that we're going to be harvesting a clump at a time as green onions. And then the taller plants in the background that are in two thirds of the bed are the garlic. And I wanted to show you something important about them. 
Now I'm going to show you something here that is a little tricky to see, but I'm going to do my best. So all of these plants are hardneck garlic plants, and it's very common for them to form what are called scapes. That's what this thing is. What the plant is wanting to do is to bloom and set seed. You don't want it to focus its energy on that. You want it to focus its energy on developing the bulb down in the ground that you'll harvest later this summer. So what you want to do is wait until the scape forms a complete curlicue, so a whole loop, clip it off the plant, and don't throw it away, don't put it in your compost pile. You want to eat these because they are wonderful. First thing you do is you parboil them, which means boiling them in water for several minutes, and then you're going to saute them in some olive oil. Add these to any savory dish, have them as a side dish. It's a wonderful garlic flavor and something you don't want to waste. Now this next bed is the other one that we have the agricultural insect netting on. This is the broccoli bed and then Bill has also snuck in some more of the bok choy plants. Both of those are members of the cabbage family, so they can get horrible aphid problems and lots of cabbage worms. So let me show you how the plants are doing. Look at how beautiful they're doing. No insect problems whatsoever. Even those sneaky tiny aphids haven't been able to make it through the netting. And I also see that one plant has started developing a small head of broccoli, so that's cool. Wow, it's starting to get quite warm, but I am not complaining after all of the cold and all of the rain. <laughs> this is the carrot bed. I've got four rows of carrots, and then Mr. Bill snuck in some onions down the middle of the bed. There's also a volunteer sunflower at the far end. The thing that is really important with carrots is that you thin them to approximately a three inch spacing within each row. That is to give the root plenty of room to develop. Unfortunately, when you're thinning your carrots, you can't transplant anything that you've pulled up because that activity has damaged the root hairs and that affects its ability to develop a normal root. But don't forget to thin your carrots if you haven't already. Now right next to the carrot bed you can see we've got five cloth grow bags with potatoes growing in them. And actually in the background in the next row of beds you can see there are five more cloth grow bags with potatoes in them. Yes, we do love our potatoes. We grew them in the cloth bags last year and it was so easy harvesting them in the fall. What happens is you just tip the bag over onto a tarp, let's say and just feel through the potting soil to find the potatoes. You don't have to dig into a bed or into the ground with a shovel or a trowel where you risk maybe stabbing it with that. Here's a close up of a couple of the bags. You can see that the plants look really healthy. They're growing super well. And just the other day we started filling up the soil more within the bags and that is partly to foster the development of more potatoes and even more importantly you don't want any potatoes to be exposed to the sunlight because they will form a natural chemical called solanine which is toxic. So it does serve two purposes. Now this next part is what I like to call our famous bean arbor because everybody goes nuts over this. So it's made up of four individual trellises and I plant the beans on either side of a pathway. They grow up and over the trellis which means I can stand in the shade during the heat of summer while I'm harvesting beans. So this year I'm growing two new to me varieties, rattlesnake and vortex. They tend to be more heat tolerant which I thought was important after last year's heat wave. Here's another vertical element in our garden. This is an arbor for growing pumpkins and winter squash on. It's made from two individual livestock panels, also known as cattle panels. And again, they're going to grow up and over this arbor. 
and it should be great fun watching them as they develop. So I'll definitely give you some updates on them. Here are two more beds of tomatoes. These ones are paste tomatoes. And so these ones are great for making sauce and salsa because they're meatier tomatoes. They're not so watery. And once again, I'm growing them alongside some sheets of concrete reinforcing wire that's attached to sturdy fence posts. The plants are doing great. Yeah, they're probably not as big as yours, but they are starting to come into their own. I even see a few little flowers, so there's hope yet. Okay, we've got four more beds to talk about. These are all located to the south of the main part of our garden, and I've got a few goodies growing in them as well. In this 16 foot long raised bed, half of the plants are a bush type of both summer squash and winter squash. So three of them are an orange acorn squash, which I grew last year. It's called Goldilocks. It did really well for me, and we thought they were tasty, so I thought I'd grow them again. And then there's also two Cocozelle zucchini plants. Those were amazing last year, too. The other end of the bed is planted with a type of cantaloupe. I'll put the name on the screen because it's quite a mouthful. It's my first year of growing this variety. I have grown melons quite a bit over the years, and you just can't beat the taste of a fully ripened sweet cantaloupe. Now you'll notice I've got all sorts of the toy snakes on this bed, just on the melon end of the bed. And that's because a bunch of quail or some kind of bird was nibbling on the leaves, and I thought that has got to stop. So hopefully that will give these poor plants a chance. Now this mystery bed has a bunch more of those Goldilocks orange acorn squash growing in them. I didn't really have any plants for this bed, believe it or not. And I thought, you know, those acorn squash store for so long over the winter months, that would be a great thing to plant. And I just have the floating row cover over them because I'm also trying to keep the birds away and this is another method for that. But I'm going to give them about one more week under the cover and then I'll take the cover off for the rest of the season. The last two beds have corn growing in them. This is sweetness by color. We have grown it for years and have had great luck with it. The corn is delicious. And I was all set to try a new variety this year, but Bill said, you know, I just love that variety. So can't we please plant it one more time? <laughs> so here we are, but the plants are doing really well. Again, now that it's warming up, they should start putting on quite a bit of growth. Well, okay, there's another bed to show you. I forgot that we have this small bed behind our little greenhouse and Bill has five different tomatoes growing in it. I believe they are all pandorino, which is a cherry tomato that makes fantastic salsa. And then he has more pepper plants. You can see on the left front, there is an elephant garlic growing in there. We also have some asparagus plants. The sad story about asparagus is that in this bed, the gophers keep eating the roots. It is so annoying. We've tried everything. And so if these plants get eaten, we are just giving up on growing asparagus. Dog on it. And then that flowering plant at the front right is chives. That is great for attracting pollinators, I might add. Now, as you can see, our greenhouse is almost empty. It took me forever to get most everything planted. But what I wanted to point out is those two big pots at the center in the back have sweet potatoes growing in them. Those were ones that we started in a jar of water earlier this year, and then Bill transplanted them out here. We grew them last year. They did really well. So we're trying them again. And he also planted some in some pots in another area of our garden. Okay, that's the end of the June vegetable garden update. I hope you found it interesting. I'm sorry the video was so long, but it takes a while to go through bed by bed and point out things. I hope that your vegetable garden is doing awesome and that you're not having to deal with challenging weather. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. I'll see you next week. Happy gardening.